ES Audio. You hear a lot of different stories these days about the way CEOs become and remain successful. But have you ever heard one where the CEO fired themselves to boost their business? It's had a profoundly positive impact on the results of the business and it's had a profoundly positive impact on the actual working environment that we have as a business. Sam White is founder and now chair of Freedom Services Group in the UK and founder and CEO of Stella Insurance in Australia. When she decided to take the plunge and become her own boss in her early 20s, she found herself dealing with sexism and criticism on top of competition in a hugely male-dominated industry. I just couldn't get funding. You know, banks would just not take me seriously. I couldn't get investment. This is a story all about dealing with put-downs, going against the status quo, and finding a new way to run your business based on your strengths. It's okay for me to say that my strongest suit is not necessarily leading teams. I'm John Weeks from the Evening Standard, and this is How to Be a CEO. Since starting her first business at the age of just 24, Sam has made a name for herself, not just in the insurance world, but also by representing the LGBTQ plus community. Stella Insurance has become the first to offer a non-binary option on quote cover. And Sam has also set her sights on making the insurance industry as a whole a lot fairer. So Sam, I understand you've got an interesting story behind how you got into the world of business in the first place involving brainstorming in your sister's conservatory. So how did you get started in business? Yeah, it's funny. I was chatting to somebody about this the other day, and I always say I started my first company when I was 24. But actually, I think the entrepreneurial bit probably started earlier than that. Um, I I, I was oh, best described always as a, a bit of a hustler. And, you know, at 13, my granddad died and left me and my sister like I think it was about £1,500 at the time. And I persuaded my dad, instead of putting it in a building society, to let me buy a car, um, which was a Triumph Spitfire. And I was doing um, a BTEC in motor vehicle technology. And so I did the car up in the garage with my dad and then sold it on for a profit. So I think I was always kind of a little bit interested in how you can make something. I, I always say how you can make something out of nothing or you know, kind of take control of your own destiny in that way. And I think it was the same when I started up in my sister's conservatory. I'd had sort of one job (laughs) and I'd done all right at the job. I'd got kind of promoted multiple times, but I just didn't enjoy working for somebody else. I did not like somebody telling me what to do. It just felt all wrong. And so I, I was kind of like, whatever I do, I need to try and find a way to make money but that I'm completely in control of my own destiny in doing so. So obviously you started up your first business in insurance, stereotypically a boring industry to go into. Why did you go into it? What sort of tempted you in? Yeah, yeah, nothing, uh, you know, I mean, we laugh about this. If you mention that you work in insurance at a party, then people are likely to just leave the room. So it's it's not the sort of thing (laughs) that people are going to get attracted to. And to be fair, it could have been anything. The issue for me wasn't the industry that I went into. The issue was business in of itself. And I'd love to be able to tell a story now and say, you know, at 24, I knew it was male dominated and I wanted to change it. But but actually, the reality is that sort of stuff came on for me after a period of time, having experienced certain things in the industry and and seeing the things that I wanted to change. But actually getting involved in that market was just by virtue of the fact that that's where the opportunities were for me in in the early days. I started off doing a couple of different projects for different people. And because my first job had been in insurance claims and I had relationships there and people that were interested in engaging with me, that was the direction that I kind of went in. If I'd taken the job in the CCTV company, post university then i'm sure i would have had a a more heavily lent career in in that regard and i totally get what you mean about people at a party my partner is an accountant and it's very much the same reaction <laughs> yeah yeah no follow up questions at all other than i had a claim and it went horribly wrong and can you explain to me why they don't 
you know, they don't do things. And probably from an accountant viewpoint, tax questions uh, probably come up on a regular basis. So looking back to when you sort of started off, society was quite different. And I understand you had trouble with people taking you seriously, which seems insane to say these days. But what was that like for you? What did you experience in that way? And how did you deal with it? Yeah, so I think the thing to always remember is that you get used to stuff dependent on the environment that you're in. And it's only often upon reflection that you look at something and go, oh my God, that was all, <laughs> you know, that was really bad by today's standards. So the very, very first job that I had out of university, so I did in fact have two jobs. This first one didn't last so long for obvious reasons after I explained what happened, was working for a plastics company. And I set up a business unit within a business. I was supposed to just be doing telesales for them and nothing was set up. So I ended up setting up this business unit and it actually went really well. So well, in fact, that the big boss of the parent company wanted to come down and have a meeting and, you know, ask me how I'd done various different things, which I was probably 20 years old, 21 years old at that point. And because of the way that I was doing the job, I was selling stuff, doing all the marketing, doing the stock control, but I was also going and packing everything up. So I was generally really scruffy. So I got dressed up because this big boss was coming down. Anyway, long story short, he was really lovely, very complimentary, very impressed with what I was doing. And then my boss the next day called me into the office and I thought he was going to kind of give me a bit of a pat on the back. And instead, he proceeded to tell me that they'd had a health and safety inspection the day before and that my breasts were a health and safety risk in a factory environment. <laughs> Now, I, I, can, I can laugh about that now because I'm older and wiser and, you know, you, you can take it, uh, you know, you can take the, the humour in the situation. But at the time, I was absolutely mortified, you know, for a variety of different reasons. And, you know, I had the usual experience in my 20s of having business associates that I thought were genuinely interested in the business that would then pounce on you on a night out and you know I had famously one guy that I had to knee quite hard in the crotch because we were in a, a nightclub and he thought he would get feisty with me so there was just there was a litany of those kind of sets of circumstances early days and then compounded by the fact that I just couldn't get funding you know Banks would just not take me seriously. I couldn't get investment. But, I, you know, I am a great believer what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. And I think you do find different solutions to problems under that circumstance. And, and it can kind of breed a bit of a stuff you, I'm going to do it anyway mentality, which I, I certainly deployed. So going from problems to solutions, on your website, it says that you want to fundamentally change the insurance industry for the better. What does that change look like? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got obviously a couple of businesses in the sector and there's different problems to solve for. So Freedom Services Group is obviously the UK based entity. It's grown over a period of time. I think it's fair to say there's multiple issues in, in insurance in the UK that people would like to solve for. One of the, the main things for me is how we rate on insurance. So it's it's fundamentally discriminatory. And, you know, that bothers me from a societal viewpoint because what happens is people that are struggling are further penalised, and this is true in banking and insurance and, you know, the, the whole financial services sector because we rate on things like credit score, postcode, things that if you're already in a difficult set of circumstances, it's gonna, it's gonna make it even worse. And I think the problem to solve for is how do we make that fairer? How do we produce insurance policies that are genuinely reflective of an individual's risk and not of a, a set of circumstance that they may find themselves in? And, you know, we launched a telematics proposition in, in Freedom, which is, you know, black box technology and, and people have in the past been a bit uncomfortable with that you know oh, big brother's watching us despite the fact that your phone tracks absolutely everything that you do and everyone you talk to <laughs> regardlessly but one of the things that we can do with that is that we can take out some of the more discriminatory factors and 
give a fairer rate to somebody who is a good driver that happens to be living in a bad area. So that that's one example from Freedom's perspective. Stellar Insurance, which is the, the proposition that I have in Australia and I'm launching in the UK, is all about women and unapologetically so. So what we've done there is design products from scratch um, around women and women's needs and desires. The marketing is extremely focused around women, but also we are giving $5 from every policy that we sell to Women and Girls Emergency Centre. And we've taken out clauses in the insurance policy that we know would have a negative impact on a woman that was a victim of domestic violence, for instance. And we're looking about around designing actually specific insurance products to support women that kind of lay dormant in the core product that they might purchase from us. And when you were sort of talking about the insurance issues at the start, the one that came into my head was when I was 17 trying to get car insurance. At the time, there was quite a disparity between boys getting insurance and girls getting insurance at that age. Is that the kind of thing you want to crack down on, that sort of discrimination, which I know to a point is necessary? Yeah, so I mean, that's changed in the UK. You can't actually rate women cheaper than men because there was a EU directive. I think that the problem from an insurance viewpoint is young male drivers are the biggest cause of catastrophic accidents in the UK. And because we've got an unlimited liability environment in UK insurance, it almost becomes impossible to rate them. So it's such a high risk that something really awful will happen and there's a massive liability attached to it that the market's really struggling to find a solution. And I think um, the only way then to tackle that is to work with that group, which happen to be young men, and work out what you can do to get them to change their driving behaviours and change some of the risks that they are choosing to take at, at that age. So it then becomes more about risk mitigation than in insurance in order to solve the problem of being able to get them the premiums that you would wish to get them. Let's take a break now. I'm off to update my insurance policy. In the meantime, why not give us a follow so you can stay on track with our weekly episodes. So Sam, looking again at the Freedom Services Group website, there's a lot around humans really and working with people. I know from personal experience that workplace relationships can be some of the toughest to get right for various reasons, usually around communication. What's the recipe for the perfect team? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I have certainly been on that journey over the last 20 odd years. And I, I used to focus a lot on the sort of individuals that you brought into the management team and what kind of skills they had and, you know, how how I thought that they could positively impact the business. And I was missing something that really is glaringly obvious when you take a step back, but probably is a virtue of my own pathology. You know, I had quite a traumatic childhood, shall we say. It was, it was quite dysfunctional. And that, you know, whilst being one of my biggest strengths, the the desire to do things for myself and be independent and solve problems by myself, because potentially that support network wasn't there as a small child, that actually, I think, impacts your ability to create a really good, healthy team dynamic. And I think it's, it, for, from my experience of meeting other CEOs, it's a fatal flaw in CEOs, you'll often find they've got the same pathology as me, which is I can do it myself. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tackle this. I'm going to take it on. That actually restricts the ability to create a really good, healthy team dynamic. So I've been very open about the fact that I fired myself as CEO in January and I replaced myself with a psychologist. And the thing that's really interesting about that, that I can see so clearly already is that his focus is completely on creating a healthy psychological environment for that management team that should cascade down into the rest of the business. And it's about them moving as a group, like acting as a group. So one of the decisions that they decided to take on a few months ago was that they all decided to be paid the same. 
So they're all on exactly the same salary. And so the, there isn't a, you know, more money for the finance guy than the culture and engagement person, or it, the, the, there's no hierarchy that within their team environment. But also if they all want to improve their working conditions, Conditions or improve their salary, they all have to move as one, which means any decisions that they make have to be team decisions and not individual decisions. And there's lots of little things that he's deployed from a psychological viewpoint to improve what he would call professional intimacy, to make sure that they are actually really kind of connecting as a group. And I, I mean, it's had a profoundly positive impact on the results of the business and it's had a profoundly positive impact on the actual working environment that that we have as a business so I, I you know I, I by no means think that I've got the magic formula but I do think we've made huge shifts in the last 12 months to kind of really get under the knob of that wow so that's quite amazing that your teams have come to that kind of decision when it comes to things like pay is it quite humbling to know that you're still learning as a CEO these kinds of ways of getting better results, but also improving the working environment, as you described? Yeah, I think you've got to get out of your own way. So, you know, I've done all the therapy, I read all the books, I'm constantly kind of trying to get to my own blind spot. So I always say one of my favourite expressions is that everybody is a hero in their own story. And, and the reason that I love that expression is because it means that um, you're likely a villain in somebody else's. And the question for me is always, where am I not? Where am I being a hero? That's going to be easy. I'm, I'm always going to mentally paint myself in the best light. It's where am I being a villain and how can I how can I balance that stuff out? And, you know, CEOs naturally have strong egos, big egos, because they need it to be able to break down walls and get through stuff. So I need to know that about myself and know what impact that can potentially have on a a team environment. And it's okay for me to say that my strongest suit is not necessarily leading teams and to to support whoever is going to be the best person in, in that. Because I've got other skills, right? You know, and so that's okay. That's, you know, I don't have to be brilliant at everything. And I think we run the risk in our culture of wanting to have this sort of pedestal position. And in a business environment, that's the CEO. You know, we put them up on the pedestal and people can buy into their own hype that they're some kind of magical unicorn that has the answers to all these problems and can fix everything. And, you know, the the one thing that I know is that, that is not true. And so the answer will come from getting that right team dynamic and supporting that right team. Okay, so is psychology a bit of a hobby for you? Because I was looking at your own podcast, Human Business, and I wanted to ask, what is it all about? And why did you want to get into doing it and sharing messages, essentially about psychology? Yeah, so I mean, I did a psychology degree. I obviously worked out that I wasn't going to make a very good psychologist and so (laughs) pulled out. But I do love human psychology because I just, everything that we do is about people. Like whatever it is, the reasons why we choose to pursue certain paths or not is always about people. And whether you're successful or unsuccessful in an area will always be about people. So if you don't understand people, then I, I honestly, being genuinely honest, I look at a lot of really sort of blue chip corporate environments and I wonder how on earth they're still in existence because the psychology is often awful. There's often a real repression in those businesses and people almost playing a part of pretending to, you know, they, they put on a cape of I am a CEO or I'm a compliance person or I'm what, and they go into situations and they're not, you know, they're not being their authentic self and they're not having the real conversations. And I think it just creates a, a bad environment. So yeah, I'm fascinated by psychology in terms of people generally, but I do think it has a a big impact on the business environments that you have. And for human business, because I'm in insurance and because I've created an element of a profile over the last few years, 
and because I'm female and there's not many women in insurance, I would be asked to talk a lot. And I would generally be asked to talk about things that don't hold as much interest for me. So yes, I understand the market and I understand the, you know, the tech progressions and data science and all that stuff, but it isn't really where my passion is and it's not really what I want to be talking about. So I kind of started creating human business to have the conversations that I wanted to be having as simply as as that. And then for me, it was always about, you know, I've had conversations with some really high profile people in the insurance industry. I'm more interested in What's your background? You know, what motivates you? What are your fatal flaws that you've kind of recognised in yourself over the years? And also bringing in people that I wouldn't necessarily do business with. So, I, you know, Cindy Gallup, who's an absolute badass 62-year-old woman in, you know, works in the sex tech industry or, you know, Andy King that was part of Fire Festival. Those are all people that I personally am intrigued by because they kind of go against the grain and and being able to have those conversations was was really important for me. And just going back to the first point, it feels like there has been a bit of a shift in modern workplaces, you know, with staff trying to be a bit more empowered. I don't know if you've seen the recent thing called quiet quitting. Do you think things are moving that way where staff are sort of taking the reins of power and bringing their power as a collective to the fore, essentially, where in the past that wouldn't really happen. Absolutely, and I think that's a generational issue. You know, there's a lot of tension, I think, between the older generation and and the younger generation in terms of my generation and above was very much, you get a job, you know, you you work for that organisation, you do as you're told, you follow the rules, and if you're lucky, you'll get promoted and you'll, you'll move through the ranks. And what I see in the younger generation is a complete disinterest in that as a strategy. So, and they are very challenging and they do have more information than people have ever had before. And so they aren't prepared and neither wish to work in an organisation that is telling them what to do as opposed to asking them to join them in solving a problem. And I think that's where that team dynamic comes in. Like people talk about work ethic. I've got people that work for me that I genuinely have to try and stop them doing more work because they're empowered, they're passionate about what they're doing and they, you know, they're they're constantly thinking about what's the next dynamic. And that, if you get it right, that's the beauty of the next generation is that they will kind of run through walls and really be, kind of on side and thinking about what they want to be doing with you. I think if you get it wrong, psychology's wrong, environment's wrong, you will get quiet quitting. You will get people that are just completely disengaged from whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. And that's the problem, I think, that a lot of the larger, more corporate organisations are really going to struggle with over the next few years. And it's going to be interesting to watch that unfold because particularly in something like the insurance industry that's I think even slower to pick up on some of this stuff I mean we we just went to the four-day working week we've got that piloting in in the business in freedom services at the moment and the amount of um stick I got from people in the industry that were just it can't possibly work like can't work and it's you know very very fixed mindsets which are going to struggle. So at the risk of buying into your own hype, Sam, (laughs) God forbid, for young people now, perhaps sat in their sister's conservatory, trying to come up with business ideas, ways of earning money. What's your advice to them for being successful? I'm, I'm asked this a lot. And, you know, I probably come up with different answers on different days because there's so much stuff that goes into growing a business. But I think, you know, One of the main things for me is about action. Like if I can do something now, I do it. You know, if an opportunity comes up, I take it. And I don't overthink the consequences of that too much because I think life is chaos and business can be chaos as well. And people like to think that there's a real order and process to this. But if if you're starting up and you're trying to get some traction, then you need to be very open to where that traction is going to come from. 
and you need to be flexible about how you how you solve for those problems. So for me, when I was sat in my, con- my sister's conservatory with a, a phone, I was on the lookout for, OK, what else can I do for my customers that is going to add value, that there can be an exchange between us that I'm confident I can do for them? And if I thought something was there, I would do it. I didn't go with a really rigid business plan that refused to change based on what I was actually experiencing. And that, I think, is is the rub for people when they haven't had their own business. Like mindset for me, I think, is the absolute critical piece. If you have a fixed mindset, get a job, don't set up your own business. And, you know, that is my absolute sort of mantra. You've, you, you've got to keep that flexibility. I think that's only going to get worse based on all of the things that we've talked about in terms of the changing environment at work. It's, you know, you're going to be asked to be even more flexible, not less. So kind of get with the program early and you should be okay. That was Sam White, founder of Freedom Services Group and Stellar Insurance. For the best business news, interviews and analysis, go to standard.co.uk forward slash business or pick up a copy of the Evening Standard newspaper. How to Be a CEO is back at the crack of dawn every Monday. Why not give us a listen to start your week?